A very good evening and warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. And welcome to an evening where we've got a slightly different touch. We're going to be trying some fantastic wine, including one of the most iconic wines, if not the most iconic wine we have in South Africa. But we are also going to be having a look ahead to a wine auction. Now, I have to give a disclaimer here. It's kind of like if you're a betting company and you have to put something up, you know, betting can be bad for you. So wine auctions are enormously dangerous. And uh, we're going to be having somebody on the show just a little later who's got an incredible wine auction coming up, a wine auction that my wife has explicitly banned me from going anywhere near after discovering the delight of buying wine on auction during the course of lockdown. Uh, but we'll have to see just how good the wine is. Maybe I can somehow sidestep our demands. The man in question is Roland Pins. He does a terrific job putting together the wine for the Strauss auctions. I've done a lot of work with Strauss over the years, particularly at the Cape Wine Auction, where they are such able partners and Roland will be telling us about some of the wine. I think it's entirely European wine, so giving us an introduction to the wine that is coming up on auction. That's going to be uh, just a little later on in the show. Before we get there, though, we've got somebody who I, I have to say we, we haven't had on the show before, and I'm not sure how, because he's uh, not just a fabulous winemaker with a great story, uh, but he's so entrenched in his particular estate that I, I think he's technically part of the terroir at Claim Constantia. He's been there for a fair while now, but not before, having travelled the world and made wine in all sorts of interesting places. And he's got with us tonight the two wines that celebrate claim Constantia so well. One is the Sauvignon Blanc. We've got three versions thereof, the Dimmersdal of Constantia, if you like, and also something on the sweeter side. And as you will have guessed by now, I'm sure, the Van de Constance, which is in its latest vintage. I get to taste it tonight and all on my own. Nobody else is getting any of it and I can't wait to get into it. So let's meet our acclaimed winemaker, Matthew Day. A very good evening. How are you? Brilliant. Thanks for having me, Dan. Such a pleasure to be on the show um, and to show off some of our, our really interesting wines. Now, of course, you say that, and you say that very sincerely, and I'm sure there's an element of gratitude, but I think most of the gratitude comes from the fact uh, that you're avoiding bath time by being able to jump on the wine show with you. <laughs> yeah, we all know how it is when you've got young kids in the house. So it's actually, don't tell anyone, I'm, I'm actually loving being here because I don't have to be at home with all the chaos. So. End of the day, chaos is not fun. <laughs> How old is the little one? Oh, what, eight, eight weeks? Eight weeks. Yeah, the eldest is four, four years old and the youngest is eight weeks old. So it's, it's a bit crazy at home. Um, I go to work to escape. It's my, it's my away. It's my happy place. I absolutely love it here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's yeah. a nice comparison, that, given that we're drinking Sauvignon Blanc, because four years is when Cape Townians like to drink their Sauvignon Blanc and eight weeks old is when Johannesburg is like to drink their Sauvignon Blanc. So, nice comparison there. Yeah, well, I guess um, I grew up in Johannesburg and all that I knew was sweet Merlot and that's about it. So, so it's it's crazy to be talking about Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, when I, was, when I was young, I wouldn't even know what the hell Sauvignon Blanc would have been, you know, so it's nice to chat about it here tonight. Which, uh, which is the natural starting point for a conversation with you. You are a well entrenched acclaimed. You've got a, a great reputation as a winemaker. How did the kid from Mondial High, Johannesburg South, where you tend to matriculate when you're 22 and normally with a prison record, end up in the heart of Constantia with brilliant wine? Yeah, it's a crazy story. I mean, um, yeah, I so I went to Mondial and it's absolutely crazy. I think very few people actually left Mondial High School and went to anywhere further than the, the Southgate kind of mall. Um, the reason why I left Joburg is I, you know, I kind of had to get out of the place and try something new. Uh, and I had to find a career that would ensure that I never had to go back to Joburg and work in Joburg. And winemaking was, was a sensible topic. You know, there's no vineyards out in Joburg. Um, and I got to stick in this area and, and have fun. Um, that being said, I, I grew up in a, on a farm in south of Johannesburg. I um, was driving a tractor before I could touch the pedals and all the rest. And I, I, did, I grew this passion for, for farming um, and also had quite a love of wine growing up. Uh, and yeah, eventually just decided to go to Stellenbosch. Uh, I think when I told my parents I wanted to study winemaking, they almost fell off their chair. Um, but my dad kind of said to me, look, we can do this. You can go to Stellenbosch, um, but I'll give you one chance. If you don't come right, you can go and pack um, 
pack bags at spa or pick and pay or something like that and you have to pave the way for yourself after that unfortunately i landed up here at clank and Sancho a couple of years later um yeah that's a long story but i guess i can get into it a little bit um so i studied at the university of Bellenbosch. um eventually i actually started off my career career working for roland Keynes, who's going to chat a little bit later um after working at nearlist as my student job i started at clank and Stancher after working for roland um literally as a harvest hand um in 2008 so this is my 12th year at clank and Stancher. um and i slowly worked my way up eventually became assistant winemaker still did all the 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 work like scrubbing the floors and cleaning the tanks and all the the grunt work in the cellar and then um, in 2012, Clank and Stancher was sold and the new owners of Clank and Stancher said, well, Matt, uh, we know you've been here for a little while, but prove yourself and you can have the reins as head winemaker of Clank and Stancher. Um, and I did exactly that. And 2012 was probably one of the youngest winemakers in the Cape, um, working at one of the oldest brands in South Africa, which has been an incredible task, I must say. There's a and story. I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how true this story is but it sounds great that you marched into Clay and Constantia told Adam Mason that your wine was brilliant and that he'd better hire you because he needed to get you on board yeah it was it was quite a fun job interview and I must say this is the only job interview I've ever had in my whole entire life so I literally during my student job I made it as a student you know I thought it'd be quite nice to make some wine uh, I bought a barrel um, at Nearlist I bought a barrel bought some grapes from the farm next door um, and literally made a barrel of Shiraz um, that, you know, didn't realize it was going to take so bloody long to make that a year and a half later, just before my job interview with Adam Mason, um, I just bottled this wine and I had a Magnum bottle in my boot of the car that uh, I thought, you know, it'd be quite a, quite a smart idea. I walked into his office slapped the bottle of wine on his table and i said adam try this wine if you like the wine you must give me the job if you don't like the wine we can carry on with this this interview um and yeah somehow i got the job and i'm still here today uh, we actually tasted that wine just before he left playing in 2011 um it was quite a special occasion so yeah the uh, the wine story is one that's got many fans. I see a few of them are watching at the moment. Michelle Stradham, very understated. She's sitting on the fence here. Matt is a legend. And I think Michelle has just broken the Dan really likes wine record for most emojis used in a message ever. Uh, so well done, Michelle. Uh, Kevin Daniel, what a champion. There's Kevin. Uh, so uh, that's much appreciated. Boys, and then Daryl Balfour is watching over in YouTube. Chaps, uh, enjoying a 2013 KC Metis Sauvignon while watching lovely wine. We've got some Metis to try uh, very shortly. Uh, tell me a little bit about the time outside of Clank and San Jamaican wine because you've made wine in France, you've made wine in the Barossa Valley, you've made wine in Napa, gaining that experience, having fun around the world, and then bringing all that back to South Africa. What was the, the traveling winemaker experience like and how valuable has that been in constructing Matt Day, the winemaker today? Yeah, so the, the beauty of making wine overseas is you get to take little snippets from winemakers all over the world and you get to put that all together in, into your portfolio of, of actually being a winemaker. So, look, I, I started off in Australia in the Barossa Valley at a, a 2,000 ton cellar. It was mega, uh, but it was so much fun because of my first... My first ever proper job uh, went out there. I think I lost about 10 kilograms, um, literally shoving out Shiraz grapes. Uh, I've worked in Napa Valley. I worked for an amazing winemaker on the complete opposite end of the spectrum called Andy Erickson. Uh, he was the consultant for Screaming Eagle and a, a lot of other cult wines out there. Learned a hell of a lot about, they literally took five vines and they made wine from that. That's how niche and attention to detail they actually were. Um, I've worked in France a lot, I've worked in saint Emilion. I've worked in Lalande Pomerol. Uh, I've done quite a lot of harvest in, in Sancerre as well with our business partner called Pascal Jolivet. We'll get to that a little bit later, I guess, when we, when we taste the Matisse Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, that, that was such an inspiring experience that the winemaker came out and we made wine here together and we actually started the project called Matisse. Um, Sure, where else have I worked? The most incredible, insane harvest I've ever done was is Hungary in Tokai, 
one of the great sweet wine regions of the world. Um, this was crazy because no one had, no one spoke English, um, no one understood what the hell I was talking about, and uh, it was it was amazing because they lived uh, wine in that town. It was literally a tiny little town um, that everyone was involved in the wine industry, and the wines were incredible there. So I got to bring a lot of that back to Clankenstanshire uh, and grow, you know, our passion, Sauvignon Blanc and Van der Constance, and, and make them world class as opposed to having a South African hat when we make all our wines. When you went over to Hungary, did, uh, were you already with Clan Constantia? Did you know that Van der Constance was a big part of your future? Yeah. So fortunately, most of these jobs, except for when I was in Australia, um, were when I was assistant winemaker at Clan Constantia. Um, and I was lucky enough that they sent me to all these places. So the guys that the, were opening the doors for me to do harvests at their properties were, were very, very big producers. Um, and it's purely because of the Clank Extension name that I was able to do that. I mean, a great example is while I was working in, in, in Bordeaux or in Pomerol, um, I was able to phone up the winemaker of Chateau Ikem, and Chateau Ikem is the Rolls Royce of sweet wines in the world. And they literally op opened the doors for me, uh, rolled out the red carpet. We tasted three, three decades of, of sweet wine from Ikem. Um, she shared all her secrets with me. Uh, and that was all because of the Clank and Stancher link. And she, she said to me, Matt, you know, my, one of my iconic benchmark wines in the world uh, is the wine called Van der Constance. And she absolutely loved the place. Humbling story is she actually sent her assistant winemaker last year to come and work with us at Clank and Stancher so he could learn a little bit from me and uh, from the way that we make Van der Constance and all the rest. So it's nice to see that you know, we're, we're gaining the same kind of reputation as them and we're catching up to the rest of the world, which is great. Yeah, but it's, a, it's well deserved because uh, year in, year out, it's a wine that dazzles all over the place. We're going to get to it in just a moment. We're kicking off, though, with a trio of Scott and your blog. Last night I did Instagram Live with Seinfeld, Joe Foodie, who absolutely hates Scott and your blog. He, rather drink battery acid, but would probably say that there's too much of a similarity between the two. So he's a very prejudiced man. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the flip side today, from someone who really doesn't like it, to someone who absolutely loves it. Sauvignon Blanc is, I think you've said on several occasions, your favorite grape, and it is a wonderful expression of the Constantia terroir. But what is it, though, just generally about Sauvignon Blanc that, that's, uh, that's skipping your step? Cool, sir. Uh, Dan, I'm an absolute Sauvignon Blanc nut, um, and and obviously everyone thinks about Clank and Stancher, the first thing that they think about is Van der Constance, um, and our mission in life is to say that, you know, we make incredible Sauvignon Blancs here at Clank and Stancher. Uh, we've got the perfect terroir, the climate, the this and that and the rest thing to create one of those world-class Sauvignon Blancs. Um, so getting to people not liking Sauvignon Blanc, um, it's, it's a problem, like you remember the old days, there was the saying ABC, anything but Chardonnay. I think that changed very quickly to ADS, anything but Sauvignon Blanc. And that's purely because there's too many very poorly made Sauvignon Blancs in the world. Um, people just use Sauvignon Blanc as a cash cow. So they plant it in the wrong area. They make it with a hell of a lot of acid. My favorite joke is Sauvignon Blanc is the only thing that can make your mother-in-law smile. And that's purely because of the acidity and she like cringes when she drinks the stuff. Um, and that's generally what happens with Sauvignon Blanc. But we've gone out and we've said, we want to make a seriously world-class style of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and that's taking it very far from that, you know, that everyday drinking Sauvignon Blanc that, you know, if you, if you live in, in various regions of South Africa, they literally put about three blocks of ice with it and, and they clap a bottle just like that without even thinking about it. Sauvignon Blanc is a lot more to it than that. It's one of the most noble cultivars out there. Uh, and it's, for me, one of the cultivars that expresses its sense of place a lot better than, than other cultivars. So any tiny little change to it makes a huge difference in terms of the way that, that, it, that it tastes. Um, we've got a mission. Uh, we think that New Zealand has done a very good job in the world in terms of marketing Sauvignon Blanc. But New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are becoming uh, almost boring. Uh, and there's a great position in the world for a, another new world producer to come out and say that, you know, we can make world-class Sauvignon Blancs that compete with the likes of Sancerre and, and New Zealand and all the rest. So for the, for the lineup today, in terms of the wines that we're tasting, we've got 
three completely different styles of wine. So the very first one that, that, we, that we had, I mean, Dan, if I can get into the wines, um, the very first one is the 2019 yeah. Blanc. Is there something black or am I jumping the gun here a little bit? No, no, not at all, not at all. Welcome to Matt's Wine Show. I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, <laughs> that is our first. It, uh, it does lead uh, very nicely into, into what I was going to ask you. And uh, for me, it is the, the different styles, why and how, that is so interesting. So the first one is Glen Constantia Sauvignon Blanc. It's 2019. Uh, place it for me. Uh, what makes up this wine and where it sits within the broader Matthew Day Sauvignon Blanc empire? Okay, perfect. So this is our most important Sauvignon Blanc at Glen Constantia. Um, this is actually a blend of 36 different vineyard blocks on the property. Uh, the beauty of Constantia or Clan Constantia Farm is we've got a hell of a lot of different sites on the farm. We've got east-facing vineyards, we've got south-facing vineyards. Our vineyards range from 70 meters above sea level right the way up to 320 meters or so above sea level. Um, and if you're sitting there from Joburg and you don't know anything about Sauvignon Blanc, um, everyone's going to think that I'm absolutely mad and I'm talking rubbish. Um, I suppose this brings me one, to one of my points when it comes to Saviors. I always used to think that uh, wine is made by a winemaker um, and you can literally get a, a manual or a, a product list and you can add anything and everything and you, you probably can and you can make a wine that tastes just like your neighbor's wine. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is we have all these different aspects, we've got all these different properties that get into this wine uh, and we've, we've made a style here that is, um, number one, it's very easy to drink. Number two, it goes really well with food, so it, it is serious enough to be taken taken with food. Um, and, you know, you can enjoy it with, with every single kind of occasion. Um, it's not that battery acid kind of Sauvignon Blanc characteristic that people have come to know from it. Um, you know, we're trying to make a very fresh, easy to drink, balanced wine from it. And hopefully that's what you're going to get. We're striving for more of a a richer, riper, more tropical characteristic rather than the pyrazine, so the green pepper um, kind of um, characteristic. And another thing that I want to get to here, Dan, is you know we're 100% uh, organic in the cellar. We're doing a lot of biodynamic practices and all the rest in the vineyard. We add very little sulfur crush. Um, it's 80% wild ferment, um, so we add very little yeast in the cellar. And so we've gone to back to a very back to the basics approach when it comes to this. And hopefully you're getting a very pure characteristic of Sauvignon Blanc in the glass. It's, uh, I think even Steve Steinfeld might drink this. I, I do have to give you a warning. Yeah. I love the fact that you have to take on New Zealand and create a, a great competitor. Uh, but just remember what Jacinda Hearn did when we won the World Cup last year. She closed the borders entirely. That's how the Kiwis react when you do something better than they do. So that's what you have so, to watch out for. Uh, people watching in, I see uh, Angela Lloyd watching serious Sauvignons like Matt's deserve age. Everyone thinks Sauvignon should be drunk within the first or second year. They actually improve with age, much like Angela herself, who improves both with age and with her eighth glass of wine, as I've discovered on various occasions. Uh, Andrew Wolga watching on Facebook over in the States, enjoying the chat, guys. It's a nice change from the election madness here in the United States. What madness? It all seems lovely over in America at the moment. Uh, Melly Lambert watching in as well. Melly, lovely to have you here. I know Melly was hoping to join us today, uh, but I know she's got a, a FaceTime with Jancis Robinson or something to do, so we'll try and get it next week. Uh, and then Daryl Balfour uh, saying, I too find Huey Sauvignon very boring. Thanks for saying it. Uh, that's our last remaining four viewers in Auckland, switching off their uh, national Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, first one. All right, so we're done with it. Now, I know you say it is your most important one, uh, but would it be your favorite, Matt? Um, my favorite is I actually bottled the other day a wine called Block 382, which is very similar to the 381 that we, we're going to taste today. That 382 is probably the greatest wine I've ever made. Um, and we've made some great Vinda Constances. This is up there, the 2019 382. Um, you'll have to try it one day, Dan, um, to see what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, I, I, I love all my children exactly the same. There's no favoritism over here. <laughs> 
so we can't say that. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we go into the matters uh, and uh, talk about what's a fabulous collaboration of South Africa trying to show France how to do it properly, the uh, the number of blocks you've got thirty six blocks to make yeah. one particular wine. How on earth do you balance, work out, put together thirty six blocks? It sounds like you're just pouring stuff in everywhere and hope that hope that it works out. That's obviously not the case. But how do you manage such a broad process? So the crazy thing is that every single different block has a completely different characteristic. So we have a cellar that can house uh, about a, a million liters, um, and we only make about 350,000 bottles every year. So to give you an idea, we're able to take each and every single block, vinify it or ferment it separately in its own tank, and then only once it's grown up into its own personality, can we take take each and every single component, we compare them, and then we put it together like a jigsaw puzzle to give you that perfect picture that we're trying to create. It is an incredible wine because you can do that. You can balance the acidity with the sugar, with the freshness, with the fruit, with the intensity. And another thing that you're getting here is it's the Clank and Stancher characteristic. You'll get that with the Matisse a lot more. Um, we get a very salty, savory, umami characteristic with a lot of our wines. And that's purely because of, of where it's planted. We're on very heavy decomposed granite. Um, so it does bring out that X factor. So we try and put all those components together to nitpick that perfect wine in the, the Clank and Sanchez State Sauvignon Blanc. It can only be done by somebody who's been clinically diagnosed with Sauvignon Blanc obsession. I think we have the right person doing that at the moment. There's a definite lick of salinity to this. And, uh, Mm, it is very, very enjoyable. Uh, let's leave it, though, and let's move on to wine number two. And this is the Matisse 2017 that we are drinking. Uh, Pascal Jolivet has his name on there as well. Uh, explain how all this works. Is it really working together on a wine? Who Pascal is and, and what the story is behind the Matisse? Cool. Per perfect. So Pascal Jolivet is a, a legendary wine producer in Sancerre in, in France. Uh, for those who, the, I'm sure everyone knows who Sancerre is, but I'll explain it quickly. In France, you've got certain regions that specialize in different types of wine. Sancerre is the iconic region for, for Sauvignon Blanc in the world, uh, if you, you're going to group Puy Fumé with it. So in 2013, I went out, 2012, I went out to go do harvest with Pascal Jolivet, um, just to learn a little bit about what they do. And as I mentioned earlier, I always thought wine was made by a winemaker. When I got there, literally what we did during harvest is we went from different vineyard parcel to different vineyard parcel throughout the town of, of Sancerre and Puy. And we got to taste the grapes, look at the soil. And it's not like South Africa where it's just one big, massive farm. It's, it's parcels um, or vineyard blocks all over the town. And they've got different types of soil, different aspects, different pieces of terroir, as we call it. And you got to taste the grapes, see the soil. He went as far as saying, Matt, you know, taste these, taste the, taste the ground, see what it tastes like, see what it feels like. Then we went back to the cellar and we tasted six different wines that all tasted like those blocks that, that, are, that it was coming, coming from. Um, long story short, his winemaker came to South Africa uh, the next year in 2013 and we're literally walking through one of the blocks and he said, you know, Matt, this is perfect for my style of making wine. Um, so I said, screw it, let's, Let's try it. Let's pick these grapes. Let's make it in your style. Let's not tell anyone. And if it works out, we will tell the bosses and see what they say. We did exactly that. So his style is completely um, against the grain. So no sulfur crush, uh, no settling, straight into tank, hope for the best, wild fermentation, leave it for 12, year, 12 months on the lees. Um, and something magical happened from that. And we created an incredible wine that we absolutely loved. And then we showed the bosses and they loved it so much. Uh, that we put to get together this joint venture called the the Matisse. Long story short, but it, it is very sensé in style. It is a very flinty, spicy, umami. It shows off the soil. Um, it it is almost um, a good representation of what they could do in sensé in South Africa. 
Uh, it's a, yeah. There's a glorious, savoury feel to it. And, uh, I suspect that uh, Pascal is just as happy as you are with the wine. Is this a continuing collaboration? And is it one that works both ways now that he's come to learn from you how to do it properly? Are you going to go over and help the rest of his team to improve their wine? Yeah, so subsequently to their winemaker um, coming here, he actually went back to France and he, he resigned. He said he'd been working for Pascal Jolivet for 27 years. And he went back and he said, you know, there's so much more to making wine than just working in one property after experiencing Plank and Stantra. Um, so I've been back and forth quite a lot working with their new winemaker, Valentina. Um, and she's very like me. She's a young winemaker. She's, she's out there. She's having fun. She's doing her thing. And we work very closely together. So I go there. She comes here every year and, and, you know, my one day, one day I've got a vision that we can make a Pinot in Sancerre, which will be quite fun, called the Matisse Pinot, but I'm still working on that. <laughs> Keep us posted. Uh, I'm just waiting to make your, your wine in Mondial, but uh, I guess that's a little bit further off. Uh, plenty of people still watching in. Uh, Lisa Harlow, Frank and Sancho make some of the few stopping your last time. Enjoy, and they're so food friendly, and please aid them. Uh, and then Josephine Queer, I'm not sure if you know Josephine, she's a regular on the show. Lovely memory from this wonderful winery, Clint and Santa. My first visit was when Ross Flower was there and I joined my visit with him and already impressed by the Sauvignon Blanc. Before I left the winery, Ross gave a bottle of Constance, and I said, thank you so much. But why? The answer, it's normal for this wine to Josephine because it was the wine of Napoleon. All the best of long life for this great place and superb wine. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, also in there, uh, Angela Lloyd, drinking regular KC Sauvignon Blanc 2015. Delicious, still so fresh, but not overly acetic acid. It would further benefit except not this bottle. Uh, yeah, I can actually picture Angela drinking it out of the bottle at the moment, which is a standard approach to anything. Uh, and then Andrew Wolgar, I actually sell Pascal Sancerre over here in North Carolina. I hold it in high regard. And I'm sure testing Matt's version will be a delight. It's lovely when you see so many people as a winemaker. And I'm not sure how much you, you, you get to do that, but, but see or hear from people right around the world who've tasted your wine, who've appreciated it. And somehow something that you made three, four years ago has popped up in America or popped up in Europe. And your legacy is, is quietly spreading all over the place. That must be a really cool part of being a winemaker. Crazy. Absolutely love it. Um, yeah, we... I meet far too many people that I can't remember half of them, but that could be the wine talking. <laughs> it could indeed. I also see Michelle Loudon. So interesting learning all of this. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in, Michelle. And Lisa Harlow, the message is really like a sunset wine. You capture that minerality. You certainly do. Uh, it's uh, two down. We've got a third Sauvignon to try. We've already nailed two styles. You can't possibly have a different style to give us, and yet, Matt, I suspect that you do. So we we actually, I've gone as far as making six different Sauvignon Blancs in, in one vintage at Clank and Stantra, and that's purely because we want to experiment as much as we can to push the boundaries as as far as we can to learn as much as we can to make the Clank and Stantia State Sauvignon Blanc that much better. So 381 is that style. We've gone as far as we can to push the boundaries. Um, this is a single vineyard right on top of the farm. Um, it's actually the very only, it's the only time we've ever made a single vineyard wine from this wine, uh, from this block. And literally all it is, is we harvested just under a ton of grapes. We took free run juice straight into the barrel. We put a fermentation bung into it and we left it for about nine months and we let it do its thing. So just to explain that, we added, didn't add any sulfur crush. Um, we didn't add any yeast to it. We didn't add any nutrients. We just left it to do its thing. And then, you know, I'll never forget, I got into so much trouble for this wine purely because when we bottled it, I added a tiny little bit of sulfur. Um, we didn't filter it. Uh, we added bentonite because bentonite is the one thing in winemaking that you actually have to add for a, for a white wine. Otherwise, it becomes all cloudy and all the rest after a couple of years. A uh, little bit of sulfur. And then we bottled it. And I'll never forget, it was the day after my first child was born. My boss actually phoned me up to, uh, to chat. And I, I spoke to him. I thought he was going to congratulate me. And he said, Matt, 
I've just had a bottle of 381. It was terrible. It had re-fermented in the bottle. It had gone through malolactic fermentation in the bottle. Uh, it was cloudy and it was absolutely terrible. So all I said is firstly, you need to say congratulations for this wine, uh, for, my, for the birth of my daughter. Um, and uh, leave the wine, I've got full faith in it, and let's see what actually happens. So I went through complete malolactic fermentation, um, and I, I pulled it out because we, we opened this a couple of weeks ago, and it is absolutely perfect. It is an incredible wine. It's completely different to most styles of Sauvignon Blanc. It's flinty, it's spicy. Uh, if you know Sancerre Puy for me, it's got a very Puy-like characteristic. It's got a lot of that gun smoke to it, um, but it is out there. It's pushed the boundaries and all the rest. It is an experimental wine, so I mean, I'm not saying this is going to happen to the estates on your blank, uh, but it is as far as we can go in terms of of being funky, different um, in style. Have you tried it? What do you uh, think? I'll warn people. So I've uh, had uh, not dissimilar wines in the past. Uh, if you just take it on the nose, you're probably going to put it straight back down and ask for something else. Uh, but if you give it uh, give it a chance on the palate, I, I, I love the aging to it. I think a few people, uh, Angela uh, leading the charge, but a few people have been talking about uh, the benefits of aging a bit of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and it's it's not going to be for everybody. There are people who want their Sauvignon Blanc as that burst of freshness that's uh this is it's, it's got a little bit become a little bit more serious and it's got a little bit more depth to it um but i, th I think it's enchanting i really enjoy it yeah brilliant thanks Dan. yeah it's it shows how versatile the varietal of sauvignon blanc actually is it's not not just tutti fruity um yeah that wine that you you, you clap at any point all right. Well, the Sauvignon Blanc has uh, shown your faith in it, and you've given us be very different, the three fine examples. I think everyone has been waiting for the rock star, though, and this is the latest iteration thereof. It is your Van de Constance. This is the 2017. Uh, give us the potted history, uh, because it's not you yourselves who've been making the exact wine that Napoleon was making, but it is does have his home in Constanza. It's the one Jane Austen loved, the one that uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey had even cracked the nod. So a proper yeah. literature, and this Jane Austen rubbish, Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, the uh, uh, the history of it and, and how it comes to find its home now at uh, Constantia. Cool. So this is a very long story, um, which I will keep short. Um, and one thing I have to say here is, you know, in the past, we used to trade on what the history was, and we used to talk about Napoleon and Jane Austen and all the rest. Uh, and we've changed that philosophy at Clanker Center today. We're going out and we're saying, you know, the past was incredible. We've got the story, but the future is more important for here, for us today here at Clanker Center. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to achieve that South African wine that is iconic, that competes with the best of the best wines in the world. And we're also trying to keep this wine you know, in South Africa for the next 300 odd years, you know, we're, we're thinking for the future and we're trying to, trying to say that we're custodians to this incredible brand and we're very, very humble for that. Um, but if I, if I can get into the, the history, which I suppose is always important, the only reason why this wine became famous in the old days is purely because of the sugar that it has. Um, and I always say that we didn't have the science and technology in those days to ensure that the wine would last for a long time. Uh, and say last the voyage back to Europe in a ship. But because of the sugar, the sugar formed a preservative. And it meant that, you know, you picture um, 1685, I suppose, mid 1700s. Um, you picture people in Europe, kings and queens and aristocracy and all these famous people drinking this, this wine from deepest, darkest Africa. They would have been the coolest kids in school purely because they had this, this incredible wine. And that's exactly what happened. It became one of the most sought after wines in the world. And the list of people that used to love it and enjoy it, I suppose, is endless. Um, you know, but again, today we're trying to say, you know, we're, we're up there. We're competing with the best of the best in the world. Uh, and we want many, many more famous people to drink it as well as everyone and anyone. You know, it's, it, it is that incredible wine. Um, but in terms of the winemaking, you know, we've, we're still making it in the same style. We've gone and done, done a lot of research into the way that they would have made it in the old days. It's still made from Muscat de Frontignan. Uh, it's made from raisins, uh, and that makes it unique. And it is important to, to say uh, that it is one of the most unique wines in the world because no one else in the world makes a style like this. So it's made from Muscat de Frontignan. It's made from raisins, uh, and it's, it's 
made in a completely different style, I guess. Um, it's not made from botrytis. It's not a Novolate harvest, which most great, great sweet wines in the world are. It's in really terms not of... In, in terms of having such an iconic wine, uh, everybody's expecting something pretty similar every year. Uh, so how, how difficult is it to create something that is uh, very much a photocopy of previous years, while at the same time as a winemaker, and I'm sure you will, you putting that little stamp of Matt Day on every vintage? Yeah, so um, we're striving for perfection. Uh, we're striving for that 100-point wine. We're striving to to become recognized as the number two or the number one best wine or sweet wine in the world. So it is gonna change every year and that's purely because of the attention to detail that actually goes into it. Um, you know, the, the vintage is always different as well. The climatic conditions are always different. Um, but because of the nature of the wine, it is fairly consistent in terms of the way that it tastes and, and feels and all the rest. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've gone as far as you know, we've created our own clone of Muscat de France and for the Van der Constants. We've got our own yeast for this. You know, we've we've recreated everything that we possibly can to make this 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 wine um, incredible. I want to say great again, but I don't. I can't say let's make Van der Constant <laughs> great again today, can I? <laughs> well, possibly not the best day of the year to be doing that. Uh, although you probably have some backing. I see Grant Souls. I'm a big fan of Chen Constantia. I met Matt at a tasting at VW11. I've been buying Van de Constance ever since. I managed to secure a 2008 Magnum top class. Uh, Reginald Peckler is up at Cheetah Plains in uh, the Sabi Sand. Hey, man, I strongly believe you're having fun being part of the legends in the making of Clan Constantia. Not to mention this rustic ravine creation plus the terroir polychromatic expression. All well, thanks wow. to many of Simon van der for crafting this rich, this historical region. Finesse, says Reginald. He sends us some wonderful messages every single week. Uh, Daryl Balfour's in there as well. I opened one of Ross Gower's Sauvignons, a 91 during lockdown level five. Who said Sauvignon can't age? This one is sublime. Now I'm going to be hunting for a block 381. I think 382 is the one you want to be having a look out for. Michelle Stratum, number one in my book. Uh, and Andrew Woolgar reporting in from the Civil War. And I have some 2008 and 09 Vernon Constance in my cellar. Around $100 a bottle here in the US, but worth every penny. Just reaffirming how many fans you've got for all of your wine, I think, Matt, but especially this world famous one. Uh, so thank you for sharing them with us. Yes. I'll count down to the 382 becoming available once you feel it's ready to drink in a few years' time. But in the interim, I've got a bottle of Van de Constance to finish off, and I shall do so very happily. So, uh, uh, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, good luck with the little one. Thanks for some terrific wine, uh, and keep having fun showcasing South African Sauvignon Blanc as being as good as any in the world. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. So there we go. Probably the south of Johannesburg's finest winemaker ever graduated from Mondio. I think he probably did uh, uh, tow truck driving or something similar in, uh, in Matric. That's what they do in the south of Johannesburg. But now down in the Cape and making quite splendid wine at Klein Constantia. And we had a wonderful conversation, but we still have uh, one other person to have a chat to. So don't run away just yet because I've got someone who's running yet another auction destined to try and rob me of what remains of my lockdown savings. His name is Roland Peens. He's overseeing the wine at the Strauss auction that comes up in a few days' time. Roland, a very good evening. Hey, hey Dan, good to see you. Uh, today it's not Jancis Robinson, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chat to you today. <laughs> hey, fantastic to have a chat. I think you were listening in to chat to Matt. Uh, and I think from two perspectives, to see just how much he's trying to drive the South African Sauvignon Blanc narrative, which is a narrative that hasn't always been the most welcomed here in South Africa. Uh, and then to see him taking that uh, Van de Constance, which already had a fantastic name, but just continually driving it into this benchmark wine for South Africa around the world. Well, if you look at the last five years and Sauvignon Blanc, uh, it's the variety that has actually increased in price the least out of all varieties. So Chardonnay, uh, Shannon, Cabernet, Syrah has really exploded in price and there's a lot more premium wines, but Sauvignon Blanc still seems to be more at the value or drinking end. And it's great to see Ken Constantia trying to push out of that. And I think um, we're going to see a lot more serious and more expensive Sauvignon Blanc going forward for sure. The Van de Constance doesn't really need too much talking about. It's a quite yeah. terrific wine. It's also one you 
good. Uh, you've, uh, you've had it on a few auctions, haven't you? It's, there's been one or two on auction. I think we've done about uh, 25 or 30 vintages of, of Van der Constance, almost every single one that's been produced. Uh, it's uh, been the third biggest seller, I think, on auction at Strauss over the last year or two. So it's an iconic wine. Um, yeah, we, we've been lucky to taste all of the vintages, even back to uh, the, seven, the famous 1793, uh, which there are a few bottles floating around. And, uh, and that's a, a, a great experience. Maybe one day we'll find one of those for the Strauss auction. <laughs> uh, you probably need to taste it first. And I am free that day, Roland. I'm definitely definitely available. Uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies, obviously the greatest Christmas movie ever is Die Hard and the second greatest Christmas movie ever is Die Hard 2, but the Santa Claus with Tim Allen is always fabulous. And there's a wonderful scene when he has discovered he's become part of Christmas and they deliver the list with all of the names and he opens the door of his house and there are about 40 trucks driving by. Well, that was the scene outside my house when they delivered the collection of catalogs for the latest Strauss auction. This is part one of about a hundred of them, um, which I've got them absolutely magnificent. They're pieces of art in themselves, let alone the art that they include inside. But it's not the art that we're interested in because although the next Strauss auction has plenty of art, it's also got a fair chunk of wine. Uh, and we're gonna have a look at it. You, you've done a, a number of these during lockdown. I've been part of quite a few of them. Next one's coming up. And by the looks of things, this is an exclusively French affair. Yeah, this is quite a special connection, uh, Dan. Uh, it's not very often that you find these wines anywhere. They're very, very rare um, and top vintages or mature vintages of the finest Burgundy and Rhone domains. And these wines are the most sought after wines on the planet. It's, uh, it's, it's really over the last 10 years been the Burgundy show on the investment markets where wines have really just shot up in price as the, the small production um, meets a, a very, very growing and, and strong um, demand for fine Burgundy wines. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a story, but I'll, I'll, I'll take you back um, almost 15 centuries. That's when the Romans um, made Burgundy wines famous uh, with Chardonnay and with Pinot Noir. And then in the Middle Ages, you had these Cistercian monks that started realizing that different patches of the, of the Burgundy uh, region produced different uh, styles of wine and different quality of wine. And I'll give you one example. Um, during spring, the snow would melt in the vineyards and the vineyards that would, would melt first would be the warmest sites. And those ha happened to be the sites with the best exposure, you know, the ones that aren't in the crevices. And those vineyards ended up making the sweetest, most delicious wines. And that's how they figured out um, over centuries which ones are the Grand Cru's and which ones are the Premier Cru's and and the hierarchy of, of the Burgundy uh, system that we know today. And uh, the top end of the market, uh, the Grand Cru Burgundies, there's very little out there. Um, and the top producers are hugely in demand. So when we find a, a parcel um, with, with mature vintages or maturing vintages, it's just, uh, it's quite exciting because you just don't find these collections very often. Well, let's go into a few of them because you've made a few picks. So the first of those is a Chambertin. I think it's a Chateau Rousseau uh, that we've got some wine of. Uh, that's your, your Burgundy to kick off. Uh, tell us a little bit about this wine and why it's so special, why it's your pick, and, and how you've only got one bottle. If you're putting it up for auction, only one bottle. It must be rather special. Yeah, so um, if you were to look at uh, Burgundy over the last 20, 30 years, the, the time that it's taken for Burgundy to really explode on the market, uh, the number one wine has obviously been Romani Conti, um, the, the vineyard Romani Conti itself, and Latash uh, in Von Romani. And we do have some Romani Conti, but not those two vineyards. So I thought then, let's talk about the next most famous vineyards in, in Burgundy, and, and, and that is certainly uh, Musini and Chambertin. And uh, Chambertin has been made famous by the uh, Russo uh, family, and uh, he, he has a bottle. This um, They own a, a certain, um, or quite a large portion of this vineyard, around five hectares. So they're the biggest landowners of the specific vineyard. But this is the most famous vineyard in the town of Gevray. And um, and hence, uh, you know, you call that region Gevray Chambertin. Um, and this vineyard produces very powerful, very serious, um, extremely long aging, um, brooding styles of Pinot Noir. Um, and it's just, it's world, re world renowned. It's been drunk for many centuries and this particular producer um, is thought to make the, make the best one. And uh, it's very rare and, and, and hence um, the price, as you can see by the estimates, um, is incredible. 
Yeah, I think 60,000 Rand you think it might fetch. Uh, not from me. Um, actually, I'd like to have it. Uh, also, see the, 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 uh, the note in the catalog puts this as aging queue to 2050. Is that right? Yeah, these wines can age for a very long time. Um, Burgundy wines, you know, you don't tend to find many very old ones because they're make, made in very small volumes and they're not, uh, you know, they don't have big, deep penetration into the market. Whereas you'll find Bordeaux wines um, of age quite um, quite often, uh, but yes, Burgundy wines can age just as long as any others. Sometimes a hundred years. Um, there was a Louis Jado celebration of their 150 year old um, domain, and they were drinking wines at 150 year old um, years of age, uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So these wines do age beautifully. So the 2010 that's on auction, and um, there are other vintages, but I'm highlighting this one because it really is the best vintage um, in the last couple of decades. And if you are a collector and you're going to spend on uh, Rousseau, um, why not buy the best vintage? Because this wine uh, is not quite ready to drink yet, but it's going to be incredible over the next five, six decades. All right, I'll buy the pencil in for my 85th birthday. <laughs> no, of course not. They're not drinking it. That's my wine. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to the village of uh, Chambolet. Chambolet, how do you pronounce my French? Yes, yeah, uh, uh, Another bang in the. Yeah, so these vineyards are not very far it? apart. Um, you can literally walk from one town to another. They're, in summer, you often find um, the, the British tourists uh, going biking um, down and the French tractors trying to push them off uh, off the bikes. Um, and, uh, yeah, not very far uh, down the, 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 the slope is, uh, is Chambol Mousini. And uh, very entrenched in the, in the history of this little village, Chambol is um, the Vogue family. And the Vogue family own... The, the largest um, portion of the Musini vineyard. And Musini is, again, regarded as one of the greatest vineyards in all of Burgundy. Um, I've been lucky enough to taste Romani County, Latash, uh, Musini, and Chambertan all together. Um, and, uh, and all these wines are really right at the top. Um, they're just, uh, they've got something else, some, some, some sort of edge to them uh, that the, the rest of the Burgundy wines just um, don't have or haven't had over the last 20 years. So Chambol Musigny, the, the wines tend to be a little bit more floral, a little bit more perfume, maybe more feminine in style, um, but still lots of power, lots of structure, uh, and uh, just would be an absolute pleasure to drink um, uh, these now or, or in the next year, very long time. You, you there, Dan? I see a message from Daryl Balfour, who's busy watching on YouTube, saying, my bank manager, a.k.a. wife, has insisted I delete Roland's contact details from my address book. <laughs> well, Daryl, I, I think it's the most from, Mr. Balfour. Twitter and uh, social uh, media person. Yeah, have you got me there, Roland? <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just saying Daryl Balfour is uh, insisting that uh, his wife deletes Roland's contact details from his address book, <laughs> which... Uh, <laughs> Might be a shrewd well, idea. Well, that's the nice thing. Um, the auction, Dan, on Sunday is um, <laughs> it's a live, right. virtual live auction. Have I lost you, Dan? Uh, no, got you there, the virtual live auction. No, the, the auction on Sunday is a live virtual auction, which means you can you can literally say you're doing some work, go into the office, uh, pour yourself half a glass of uh, wine, and tell your family that you're working, but you actually could be uh, bidding on some wine. It's, it's quite a fun uh, it's quite a fun thing to to do log in on sunday <laughs> all right let's uh let's head to the final one you've recommended just before we wrap up and this takes us to the northern rhone and uh, a family who've uh, got quite a wine making history and tradition yeah so another incredible property and one of my favorite wines in the world and again the 2010 vintage this was a great vintage and uh one that's going to age for a very, very long time. Uh, this is uh, Domaine Jamais from Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire has a much shorter history of fine wine. Uh, they really were subsistence farmers uh, up until 40, 50 years ago. And the explosion in Burgundy has really only happened in the last couple of decades with the likes of Yigal, uh, Chefoutier, and uh, Domaine Jamais. And uh, Jean-Paul Jamais, who's the proprietor, um, he's made 45 vintages of this wine. And I just find that incredible. Um, very humble people. They don't have a flashy tasting room or cellar. They, um, last time I visited them, the, the 94 year old grandfather was tilling some of, um, of the, of the subsistence farming that they still do. Um, they're, they're really a, a people of the earth and yet they make incredible Syrah from these very, very, 
um, steep and rocky slopes. And uh, the Jamais uh, have the biggest holding of Cote Roti, and they produce just uh, the most perfumed, ethereal, uh, spicy, uh, powerful, um, amazing Syrah. Um, and uh, again, needs a lot of time, so difficult to find the 2010 and the older vintages. So if you're a Syrah lover, lover this is definitely one to look out for. Right. And relatively yeah. inexpensive if you compare it to the Burgundy wines. Well, I might be able to get some because Angela Lloyd, who's tempting me here, says, got three bottles of this 2010, want to bid on mine, Dan. Now, Angela, I'm just going to come and visit you and we can share them together. Um, Angela also asking, please tell me the seller has kept some of these remarkable wines to enjoy for him or herself. Uh, Greg Sherwood, looking forward to hosting our Strauss tasting in the Hanford Wine Cellar here in London. Wines are ready to go. Uh, wow, so that's lot great. And yeah. Lots of interest. Uh, just remind us, uh, if you will, Roland, when the auction takes place, how we get involved, what we need to do. Yeah, very simple. Um, you must go and register. Otherwise, if you get there at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning or get onto the website, at least uh, it's, uh, it's going to take you a little bit of time to register. But not a difficult process. So go register. You can even put some pre bids in if you if you're going to be out on Sunday playing golf or uh, out out away. You can put some pre bids in and uh, try and snap a few lots like that. But 11 uh, 11 a.m. Um, Sunday this Sunday, Strauss and Co. You you'll be able to find it on Google. And it's going to be lots of fun. This is a live auction. Alistair Meredith, he's one of the best auctioneers in the business, and uh, he's doing the the auction. And I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, sadly, we won't be drinking the wines at the same time, but it's going to be lots of fun. Well, I uh, see myself having to sneak off into my cellar on Sunday for some very important business armed um, with my laptop and a decent Wi-Fi connection. Uh, really good luck with it. It's been a really nice addition. I, I've said this a few times, but I think when you started this off, uh, there were more than a few eyebrows raised at the possibility of having wine auctions like this, and particularly the South African wines on auction. You've proved quite comprehensively that there is more than a market for it. You've done really well, and I think it's added a rich dimension to our South African wine scene. So thank you for that. Good luck with it. And uh, Daryl Balfour and I will be doing our best to avoid it, but I think everyone else will be jumping on board on Sunday and bidding away. So may it go well. Thanks and, for your support, uh, Dan. Always a pleasure. Roland Peens looking after the wine at the Strauss Wine Auction that comes up this weekend. If you'd like to buy some French wine of certain vintages, there is a terrific selection. If you would like to buy South African wine and buy brilliant South African wine, and you simply need to head down to Pick and Pay and be a member of the Pick and Pay Wine Club because when you are a member thereof, and it's absolutely free of charge, you get for yourself uh, three times the smart shopper points, 20% uh, off 10 different wines each month, 25% off a case, 25% off a magnum. And if you're buying online and it's a very easy way to shop, you will get free delivery for six bottles or more. And there really is a super selection from the stuff that's a little more affordable, a little more midweek to those bottles for moments of celebration or to put away in the cellar. So that does it for this week. If you haven't seen it already, uh, sitting up on the Dan Really OX Wine website and on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, you'll find a conversation with Rian Mansa that I had last weekend down in Cape Town. As Rian, instead of talking about his normal adventures, talks about wine he smuggled onto a train in Egypt, about trying to ration wine when you're rowing across the Atlantic, and about his love for Ken Forrester all over a couple of glasses of Delegraph Chardonnay. And next week, you'll be able to see some wine from Heidi and the Cape Wine Academy, which builds up to a really cool offer that you need to keep an eye out for. Next week, Monday, I shall be with the Newton Johnsons, and I'll be trying some of their wine. And I'll also be trying wine from Coin Rock, brand new winemaker, Skull Opperman will be joining me as well from a very special location up in the Kruger National Park. And next Thursday, the new Mentors range, the full range, about eight different bottles, including a Petit Syrah. And Iselle, the winemaker, will be taking me through those. So plenty to come and look out in the next few weeks as well uh, for some Christmas festive wines as we build up to the end of what has been a very strange year. Thanks to everybody for watching, especially those of you who've tuned in from all over the world. Uh, Lorraine Fent, a wonderful show tonight. Lorraine, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Andrew Wolgar, another great show, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for watching all the way from America, Andrew. And I hope the next few days goes peacefully 
as they can in America. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. Keep drinking South African wine. A big thank you to both of our guests this evening, uh, to Matthew Day from Klein Constantia with the Sauvignon Blancs and the latest Van de Constance, and to Roland Peens ahead of the Strauss Wine Auction this weekend. Have a fabulous weekend. Drink South African wine. We'll see you next week. Cheers.